give you all of our praise this morning. Lord Jesus, we call you into this place. You tell us that where two or three are gathered in your name, you'll show up and do awesome things, God. You'll do what we ask for, God. And what we ask for this morning is simple, Lord. Come fill our hearts with everything you have for us, with every blessing, with every bit of love and mercy, more than we can even handle, God, so much that it would flow up out of us and flow into this community, Lord. Open our hearts to receive that blessing that we can be ready to pour out. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Good morning. Um, in case you forgot, let me remind you. We're buying a building. <laughs> what do you think about that? Yeah. Yeah. Just thought, just thought you might need the reminder. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited about that. I'm trying to temper my excitement because um, it may not work out, right? We're just under contract and we're doing surveys and inspections and, and trying to get all that stuff lined out. And um, it may not be God's plan for us, but then again, it may be God's perfect plan for us. So I'm just trying to, you know, let God do his thing and not try to get in front of him. And, and, and uh, so we're asking you, because we're, we're under contract, we're asking you for the next not quite 90 days now, it's, uh, you know, the next six, seven weeks, um, we're asking you to be praying for, uh, for God's will for this. And, and so we're asking you to, to be praying for um, what God might do, one, his will for the building, D does he want us to, to relocate or not? Um, if he does, uh, be praying for how God will use that building, right? The church is not a building, it's not an event, the church is you, 
but how will God use that building as a tool to help us reach more people, help us connect more people to Jesus Christ. And so for the next 90 days or, or so, um, we're just asking you to pray and, and continue praying. Pray God gives us wisdom and get, pray God that, you know, there's four guys, four other guys who are working ferociously behind the scenes to help make this deal happen. And, and I'm asking you to pray for them um, because it's taking extra time away from their families and, and they're sacrificing their time to make this happen. And so just circle them up in prayer. Uh, that God protects them and their time with their spouses and kids through this. Another suggestion is, is, is on your way out of town, on your way to work in the morning or on your way back home from work, um, leave an extra five minutes early and just drive around the building and pray and, and pray for how God might use that building to impact our community and help us connect people to Jesus. Pray for the people who one day may enter that building and find Jesus. Pray that God might leverage that location to give us more opportunities. Pray God uses you as, uh, as he increases our efforts here. So pray, pray, pray. That's what we're asking you to do. This is exciting. Um, big stuff, big stuff. So this morning, we're uh, like we have the last, not including last week, but the last few weeks, we've been dreaming uh, a little and gaining a vision for what we're after as a church, like who we want to be, what we want to be about, what we want to be known for. And the sermon series is entitled, We Are, and we've been looking at this statement right here that I wrote a year and a half ago. COTC, Church of the Crossroads, is a church that, one, offers irrational compassion, is a church that unconnected, unconnected people enjoy attending, and is a church that expects God to do big things. And for the last two weeks, last two sermons, um, we looked at those, the first two statements first two lines in that vision statement. So uh, we are a church that offers irrational compassion. So we as a church live out there as people um, from this church. We live outside these walls with our heads up and our eyes up, and we are looking for people in need, and, and we are looking for ways to help and encourage and bless someone. So we stay aware and, and we show up wherever there is a need. That's just what, that's what Jesus did, and that's what we want to do as a church. We're also a church that unconnected people enjoy attending. And so a couple weeks ago, um, that, that's, we talked about this. That's our hope, and that's, our, that's one of our goals. Like, we want to be a hospitable church. And in some ways, we want to be a fun church when we want to have fun, and we want to smile, and we want to laugh when appropriate. At the same time, we also want to be a unified church. Like, we want to be... Uh, we want to, to look at this and be a family. And when I say family, I'm, I'm talking about maybe not like the family you grew up in that was dysfunctional and unhealthy and uh, you're trying to break some of the holds and chains from, from that past. But when I say family, I'm talking about um, a, a healthy family, healthy uh, in, in the healthy sense of family. So like we want this to feel like home. So today we want to look at the last statement. We are a church that expects expects God to do big things. So, so um, and, and it helps us to get there. Let me talk about God for a second. Our God, like the, we serve a God that is the creator of all things. Like we, we just talked in the song we just sang, like there's this exchange where God is the giver. Um, he is the one who gave us life. He is the one who, who gives us every beat of our heart and the blood that flows through our veins. He is the one who has given us breath. There, there's this exchange. He gave first, and so in return, out of uh, seeing his love and receiving his blessing, we, with all of our breath, the breath that he gave us, uh, we give him glory. So uh, our creator, the one we serve, like our body and all of its functions and systems and all of its senses, we were given to by God. He, he designed you and, and has given you everything that you have. So the resources that you have to um, create or to build or like even like um, you know scientists when they or let's let's say like like a, 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 a pharmaceutical company when they figure out that these two elements go together and create this well the only way that they could create meds is using what God has already created so the resources that we have to create and to build or to to make or the things that we saw all those all these things that we have were created by God there's nothing that is not his idea or his creation 
So you build a house that's only possible because you use what God gave you to, to even, even emotionally or in your mind and, and, and in your body, uh, your creativity and your capability and the resources. That he, it's all from God. He gave all of what you need to build with. And so God's over all things, created all things. He's over all things. And once he created, he didn't stop working, though. Throughout Scripture, God proves that when um, that he can, when he chooses to, he can supersede even the laws of nature. Like he can overrule or he can manipulate even the laws of nature. There's a story where um, God parted the Red Sea. Like the, the Egyptian or the Israelite people, God's people, were escaping from the Egyptians. They were trapped by the sea. God parts the Red Sea. They walk between the walls of water on the bottom of the sea across to the other side and escape. Like God supersedes or overrules the laws of nature. And, and he's, not, he's not bound by natural laws. He, he supersedes them when he sees fit. Even his son Jesus, when Jesus begins his ministry, um, he performed miracles. He did things that doctors could not do. Like he helped the lame to walk. He helped the blind to see. He brought the dead back to life. So ultimately, Jesus himself then even gets crucified on a cross. He dies, then by his own power, dead in the grave for two days, he raises himself back to life. He defeats death. So we serve a God that is not threatened. He's over everything. Therefore, he is not threatened by anything, even including death. So he's a God who has never been afraid because there is nothing for him to fear. So we serve a God who is greater, who is more powerful, who has no limits and is bigger than anything that even we may fear. Matthew 19, 26, Jesus himself says, with God, all things are possible. He's limitless. Nothing is impossible with God. Do you believe that? That's the question. That's one of the questions this morning. Do you believe that? Because to believe that requires faith. And, and faith isn't just, because a lot of times we'll say, I have faith, but, but I want to I make sure we understand what faith is. Faith is more than just having an understanding. It's more than just head knowledge, like I could or you could answer uh, questions about God on the ACT and probably answer most of them correctly. You have a lot of knowledge about God and who God is, but, but knowledge isn't faith. Faith is action based on that knowledge. Like I don't just believe what I've read about God or what I've heard about God. I make my uh, I make all of my decisions in life based on who God is. That's faith. I don't make my decisions based on my fear. Instead, I trust what God says in Scripture about who he is. I trust that God is not limited by my circumstances. So I don't make my decisions based on fear. I make my decisions based on the truth of who God is. That's faith. So as a church, we believe that God is Lord over everything that is seen and everything that is unseen. Therefore, as a church, because of who God is, we serve him. As we serve him, we expect him to do big things because he is a big God. He's a limitless God. Now, I want to show you something, something funny, not, not ha-ha funny, but... It, 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 it's, it's interesting, funny. So the last few weeks, we've, we've kind of gone back in time to um, the summer before this church started uh, to a time when I was praying about you, dreaming about you before I ever even knew you or knew that you would even show up here. And so I'm praying and I'm dream, dreaming about you and dreaming about this church and, and who we will be and what we might accomplish. And, and, uh, and I kind of began writing our vision or my vision for who we would be, and that's where the statement came from. So summer of 2017 is when I wrote um, that statement earlier, like we're a, we offer irrational compassion. It's a church that unconnected people enjoy attending, and we expect God to do big things. So I wrote that in 2017, and then I began to dream, okay, if we are this kind of church, how might that practically begin to look? As a church, what might get accomplished? And so here's how I thought it might play out. So 18 months ago, um, 
I thought this is where we might be today. So I'm dreaming, I'm thinking ahead, and there were some milestones I thought we would achieve. And the first, like here's, here, here's just kind of, the, from a document I wrote, here's what, here's what showed up. Um, milestone number one, if we are this kind of church, then we will serve Mount Washington Elementary School because this is where we're gonna meet. Um, milestone number two is we would serve our city in a radical day of service, which um, we don't just do, we haven't just done one, we do this all the time. Uh, Milestone number three is we are, uh, we'll launch a church where all on our launch team fully know and do, and do their role. And then milestone number four, we will have 20 baptisms and 200 in attendance by Easter of 2018. Um, I think we had, what, what did we have on Easter? Was, was Brad in here? What, four, we had like over 400 on that first Easter. But my, my vision was if we had 200, that'd be great. We had over 400 on that first Easter. Um, and so then I even got more specific and more particular, and I thought, you know, this would be, and this would be super creative. Um, what, what if we had a 2020 vision? Ah, I see, it, see that play on words. But, but by the year 2020, what would this church look like? And here's what it sounded like in my head, and here's what I felt like God was calling us to be. By the year 2020, we desire to be a church that is known by everyone in our city for our love and compassion for others. Like, that's how we want to be known, because we've been doing this. A church that when people in the city talk about it, they can immediately recall a positive encounter or a positive story. So they've heard loving stories of us. A church that carries spiritual influence in every domain of society. A church that has made a difference in the lives of individuals and families and in the overall culture of our city. And the results, we hope, will be reported like this. By the year 2020, right? A year from now, here's what I thought our church might look like. Attendance... Um, would be 300. I thought, oh, you know, I mean, I, I, 300 in a couple years would be amazing. Yeah, two weeks ago we had like 481 people in here. That's a year before 2020. <laughs> <clears throat> Baptisms, we would, have, we would have 50 by the year 2020. We already have 35 um, heading, and we still got a year to go. Uh, small groups, I thought, well, if we had 10 groups we have 10 small groups meeting in homes around the city. Um, that'll be year. We already have 13 small groups now. Um, so that's way, uh, a year before 2020. Financially, we'll be independent. We've been, meaning we don't need any outside support to continue on as a church. And we've been pretty much financially independent since, you know, middle of last year. And then multiplication, and by 2020, we want to be planning for another church plant. So looking at those numbers, um, Looking back to when I wrote those and looking at us now, my vision was pretty small. God's done some pretty amazing things. Would you agree? Some pretty big things. And, and I can't even begin to tell you what God has taught me about faith in him. I can't begin to tell you how God has grown my faith over the last two years. He's blown me away. What is happening here is, is rare and it's unique and it's actually staggering to me. Um, like this gym packed in 15 months is not my plan. And, and it's fantastic and it's amazing and it's good, but it's, you can see from what I wrote, it's definitely not what I had pictured in my mind and, and the vision that I had. And when other preachers around the community and, and guys that I know, when they ask me, what is going on, what are you doing? I'm kind of like, I mean, <laughs> we're doing you know, nothing that would nothing that would make us this big this quick we're doing our part we're being obedient and and everybody's serving and everybody's on board but I, you know I, it's it's god it's god was bigger than what we god had bigger plans than what we imagined ephesians 3 verses 20 through 21 says um, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine Right, this, this, is, this is what's happened. Like we, I imagined it, some of us imagined it, and God's done immeasurably more according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever, amen. And so with, with knowing that God is limitless and seeing what God has done here in the last 15, 16 months, um, wouldn't it be an insult to God to think small? Even for you in your own life, wouldn't it be an insult to God for you to think small about your role in his kingdom? 
It absolutely would be. So we have to be a church that trusts and expects God to do big things. We must be a church that prays big prayers. We must be a church that takes big risks. We have to be a church that has big faith. And I wanna show you something in scripture. In, in Jesus' day, there were two times when Jesus was amazed at someone's faith or a version of their faith, two times. And, 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 and it was kind of, he was amazed about faith and faith that was on two different ends of the spectrum. There was this one time when Jesus was preaching in his hometown and he, so he's preaching to his childhood friends and his former babysitters and his former teachers and, and, and while he's teaching, he's also performing miracles right in front of them. But while he's teaching and performing miracles, they start to question Jesus. Like they begin to say, well, isn't, isn't, that, uh, isn't, that what's his, isn't that the carpenter's son? Like isn't that the kid that we had to scold for breaking, what, throwing rocks? Like isn't that the kid that sat over here in my classroom? And so they begin to question Jesus and they said, who is he that teaches us with authority? And in Mark chapter six, verses five and six, Jesus says, uh, it says that Jesus could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Their lack of faith kept them from experiencing the power of Jesus. He was amazed by, I mean, here I am, I'm already performing some miracles, I'm superseding the laws of nature, and you still aren't believing, you still want to question me, you still see me as this little kid. There's another story where there's this Roman centurion, right? Romans are the enemies of God's people, but, uh, and they had invaded, and they had these, uh, these army rulers, these centurions, uh, army leaders in the country watching over things. And um, uh, there, this Roman centurion had a sick servant, and he, and, and he sends a message to Jesus. He might, he's like, look, I know I'm an enemy of you, of your people. Um, you don't need to come to my house but I've got a sick servant. If you just say the word from where you're at, I don't deserve you to come into my house. If you just say the word from where you're at, I know you could heal my sick servant. And Jesus, when he gets the message in Luke 7, 9, it says, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd, following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even among God's people even among Israel. So, to, for, so for Jesus, two ends of the spectrum of amazement, like amazed at lack of faith and amazed at this great faith. So getting personal as we move forward as a church, if Jesus were to look at your level of personal faith, would he be amazed by your great faith or would he be amazed by your lack of faith for you? What would it be? Let me use this as an, as an example or a litmus, litmus test for you. In your, one of, the, one of the, like a litmus test for your faith is how you pray. It's how you pray. And so in your prayer life this week, like just use the last seven days. If in your prayer life in the last seven days, if Jesus answered yes to every single one of your prayers this week, would the world look different? Like, would, would, would the world be changed? Would marriages be restored and people be, become, uh, 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 break the chains of addiction? And would sickness be cured? And would people experience comfort and peace? Because that's what you prayed and Jesus said yes to your prayers. Would the world be changed because of your prayers this week? Or would your food be blessed and you have safe travel to grandma's house? How did you pray? Like how you pray and what you pray for is a symptom, good or bad, of your level of faith. And I want us to pray big prayers for changed lives, for healing, and for restoration. And I want us to have the kind of faith that the Bible says moves mountains, that crushes obstacles in people's lives, that isn't intimidated um, by our fears or anything else that may be in the way. So when it comes to our faith, 
as we move forward expecting God to do big things, let me challenge you with a few truths regarding your faith and trusting a big God so that your faith will, maybe, maybe these are some things you need to understand so that your faith can grow and so that you can live out this courageous life, this amazing life that God's calling you to live out in faith. So when it comes to your faith, listen to this, you can't play it safe and please God. You can't play it safe and please God. Listen to this. 2017, I announce and I post that I'm planting a church in Mount Washington. No idea if I'd be alone doing it or, and no idea where my help would come from. Um, that, no idea what would happen. So I just announce it, kind of post it, and 60-some people message me over the next few weeks saying, yes, I'm in. I'm, I'm all in. This needs to happen. How can I help? Do you need help? So 60 people then took a risk, left the comfort of their established church, and stepped out in faith, not knowing for themselves what was going to happen or what they were in for. Like they didn't play it safe. Hebrews eleven six says this, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And for those 60 who stepped out in faith, their reward has been seeing amazing things happen, seeing this thing take place, watching God at work right here where they took their step of faith. You know what the opposite of faith is? Fear. The opposite of faith is fear of failure, fear of the unknown. And the reason that's the opposite of faith is because fear keeps us frozen. It keeps us from stepping out. It keeps us from taking risks. Not that when it comes to what God is asking us to do, not that there's not some fear that stirs up inside of us, or some concerns, like I, I can't say I wasn't afraid or concerned when I said yes to planting this church, but my fears and concerns did not lead me. My faith did. Faith is taking big risks. It's stepping out and doing things that don't make sense to our culture. And sometimes we will fail. We will. But, but I say this, if we're not failing from time to time, then we're not taking risks. Like we're, if we're not failing from time to time, then we're not walking by faith. Here's the second thing you need to know about your faith. You can't play it safe and please God. Secondly, as long as you have a guarantee, it's not faith. As long as you have a guarantee that it's going to work out, it's not faith. Back when I was in like late elementary school, early middle school, um, I, I, I was girl crazy, right? Like, I was super girl crazy. I was. Like, I was, but at the same time, I was also shy. So, with that, with being shy, but like in girls, um, I didn't want to make a fool of myself. So, back in the day, I don't know if they still do this today, but back in the day, um, if you were a shy guy, uh, what you would do is, um, if you liked a girl, you would write them a note. And it would say, uh, would you go out with me? and check yes or no, right? There's a check box, yes, check no. Anybody ever write that letter? Anybody? Yeah. Anybody ever receive that letter? Raise your hand. Anybody ever see? Yeah. Not from me because I didn't write that letter, right? Here's the letter I wrote. I wrote a preemptive letter so that I wouldn't get put down or rejected. Here's the letter I wrote. And smart, shy guys wrote this letter in order to not be embarrassed, right? My letter was a preemptive letter that said this. If I were to ask you out, like, just hypothetically speaking, if I were to ask you out, would you say yes or would you say no? Not that I'm asking you out, just, but if I were to, all right? Because I didn't want to be rejected. I didn't want to take the risk. And what really got hairy or weird is if she wrote, maybe, Maybe it's too big a risk, right? I'm not, I'm, well, then that's, maybe it's the same thing as a no, because it's too big of a risk. I'm not going to ask you out. I'm not going to write the official letter, check yes or no, because I don't know what you're going to say. I wanted a guarantee, because I didn't want to take the risk. 
And sometimes when it comes to what God's asking us to do, we want a guarantee or we're not going to take the risk. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Like faith is confidence in a big God. And it's assurance that he is with us as we do what he's called us to do. Like with this building. Like I would like to know exactly what God wants. Like I'd like to know that this is perfectly his direction for us and perfectly that, that purchasing this building is the right decision. How do we know that it is? We don't. We don't know for sure. We are, though, just doing our part and trusting that he'll do his and show us one way or the other. But we have to take the first step first and trust. Like some of this is out of our control. Like you can't have faith and control. You can have control and you can have faith, but you can't have faith and control. Faith means that we've allowed God to be in control. Back in September 2017, again, right as we launched this church, we did some things that, that there were small risks of faith. Like we did this lawnmower brigade where, you know, that's kind of weird, where we just gathered a bunch of people with lawnmowers and drove through, drove through neighborhoods asking people if we could mow their lawn for free. And we got weird looks, and we got some people who said no. And, but we, we, we got a lot of people who said yes, though. But we didn't know going in if people would accept us or reject us or make fun of us or laugh at us or, or whatever, or call the cops. We didn't know. Our first Halloween block party, right? Instead of doing a trunk or treat here on campus, we decided we're going we're gonna to throw parties in our neighborhoods. And will people show up? Will, will it be received well? Will people be suspicious? And we just, we, we didn't know it was a risk. We hoped God would, would work it out where people received us well, but we, there were no guarantees that it would work out. Hopefully, listen to this, in 2020, hopefully, We'll be in a new building. As soon as we move into a new building, we hope to begin planning for another church plant like this in another, in another town close by, right? Because we don't want to be just about us. We want others to experience Jesus and the church in the, in the way that we are here. So it only makes sense that we, at some point in time, somehow hire another church planter, help another guy do the same thing that we've done here in Mount Washington. Um, it's going to be risky. It's going to be difficult. Will it work? Will it be received wherever we decide to plant a church? I don't know. There are no guarantees, but we have to try. Like, this is too good to keep to ourselves. As long as you have a guarantee, it's not faith. But we're going to move forward and take some risks, some big risks, knowing that God is with us. Here's the final thing you need to know about your faith, growing in your faith, what faith looks like. When it comes to your faith, you, as you move, if you decide to step out in faith, you will be stepping into your destiny and stepping away from your security. Hebrews 11.8 says this about Abraham. God called Abraham to leave uh, the place that he knew as home and go to this foreign land. And God says, when you get there, I'll show you what land is going to be yours. Abraham didn't know where he was going. That's what it says. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, he obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Even though he did not know where he was going. As a church, listen, we will always change. We, we will never do something because that's just always the way we've done it. Like, we will never do something because it works somewhere else. Like, we will keep changing and we will keep adapting in order to reach more and more people for Jesus Christ. So, at Church of the Crossroads, there won't be much room for tradition here as we move forward toward our destiny as a church. Now, you need to know that because if you don't like change, um, this is going to be a tough place for you to get comfortable. We're all going to kind of stay uncomfortable in that place of taking risks for hopefully as long as this church exists, for the sake of the gospel and the sake of those who come to know Jesus. But personally, though, for you, like individually for you, my hope this year or in the years to come is that your faith explodes and that you begin to have 
big dreams, big visions from God, and that you begin to take big risks for the gospel. Like this year, one of you might share the gospel or share your faith with a family member or a friend. And you do this this year for the first time and you've never done it before, but you take the risk. One of you this year um, might decide to tithe for the first time. Like there's going to come a day where you decide, you know what, full 10%, I'm putting 10% of my income in the offering bucket and it makes no rational sense. I'm just trying to be obedient, but I don't know why God's asking me to do this. And you're going to do it and God is going to stir something up in you as you do it. God is going to change you as you do it and he's going to bless you and you're going to see amazing things in your life as you do it. Some of you might start a life group this year. Like it, and, and you're the guy who in the past was too busy for life groups, couldn't commit to life groups, just never could make it, or it wasn't a priority for you. And, and recently you've joined a life group, you're now in a life group that meets in homes during the week, and you love it. Like you're the guy now who doesn't miss. And for some of you, this is going to be your year where you step out and you start a new, glu- a, a new group because you want people to experience what you've experienced in life groups. You're going to take that risk. And at some point, you're going to, you're going to, God's going to do some amazing things through that. Some of you are going to start serving in the kids' ministry this year for the first time. You've never worked with kids. You don't even know if you're good with kids. But you're going to volunteer to sign up because it's a need. And, and it's going to be scary. And you're going to walk in not knowing anybody and in some ways not knowing what you're doing. But at some point this year, as you serve, you're going to find that working with kids is the best part of your life. Some of you are going to experience that this year. Some of you are going to start a business this year, a new startup, and it's going to be scary, and you're going to think, I don't even know what I'm doing, but at some point, you're going to find your stride as you strike up this business, and you're going to love being a Christian business leader who loves his employees well and sees your employees as human beings and not just a number. You're going to lead differently, and you're going to love it. Some of you... I don't, I don't know what it is for you, but something is burning inside of all of us. Like God is calling us to take a risk. God is calling you to do something that is outside of your comfort zone. I don't know what it is, but we all have something in us that's been burning for some time. Something that's going to require faith. Something that's going to require a risk. Like it's one of those things that, that if you do it, the only way it's going to happen is if God really is big. And if God really is with me through this, and it's going to require you to to not play it safe, there's not going to be a guarantee, but you know you've got to step out in faith. What is it for you? For some of you, it's getting baptized, like taking that first step of faith. For some of you, it's serving and getting out of your seat and getting involved. For others of you, it's, it's, it's adding to your small prayers, bigger prayers of faith. You stop praying these little prayers over your food and over your family and keep my kids safe and bless my food and, and help me have a good day and help me lose five pounds this week. Those are okay. It's okay to pray those things. But for some of you, 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 you know you need to start praying big, risky prayers. God, show me what you're calling me to do. God, lead me into what it is you want me to do. God, I, I, we're, we're praying prayers for broken chains and for for um, addictions to be broken and for marriages to be restored, and you're praying prayers outside of yourself. And this is important for a church for this reason. As you grow in your faith, and we watch you take risks, and watch God come through in your life, what happens is we grow. Because we see God come through for you. We see God with you and what God is doing in you and through you. And it makes us go, man, I, I, I need to get with it. I need to follow God better. So this year, heading into 2020, for the year 2019, we're not going to sit back and relax. We're going to lean into God. We're going to be a part of the bigger, pic- pic- bigger picture. And we're going to do some big stuff. The stuff that he's called us to do that we've been kind of resisting. Let's pray. God, thank you for taking the risk for us and sending us Jesus. 
sending the message that we're worth it to you. We're worth it enough for you to come to this earth, die for us so that we might live. God, help us individually, each one in this room, to begin to see you as a big, limitless God. Help us to not just know that and believe that, but help us to live as if you are a big, limitless God, a big, limitless God who lives inside of us. Your power inside of us is promised through the Holy Spirit. We have what it takes in you. Help us to live with no fear, no resistance, but an all-out reckless abandon for you. Your sons, then we pray. Amen.
when dead in my sin Lost without hope with no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in Oh, when death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained My orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet and my feet rose to death Oh, when death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so free washes over me You have made me It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new. Now life begins with you. Release from my chains. I'm a prisoner. No more. My shame was a ransom he faithfully bore. Oh, he canceled my debt and he called me his friend. Oh, when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost.